Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Tom Alves, I'm the Head of Development at Ahuri and I'm delighted to welcome you to this latest event in our Ahuri Research Webinar series. I want to begin now by acknowledging that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the various lands on which you all work and are joining us from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to lands and waters throughout Australia. Ahuri is very pleased to be able to offer this research webinar series. It's both a means of keeping you informed of our latest research and also helping you to engage with research findings from our ongoing program of research. At a time, of course, when our face-to-face -face conference and events program has been, for some time now, on hold. Today is the 14th and indeed the final instalment in this series for 2020. If you are interested in catching up on any of our previous webinars, um, these recordings are freely available from the Uhuri website and I encourage you to go and have a look at them. We created the Uhuri COVID-19 Research Hub back in March as a platform to host relevant news and our own analysis of key policy decisions that relate to housing, homelessness and cities in response to the pandemic. Uh, we also commissioned the COVID-19 research agenda, which was eight rapid research projects designed to answer some of the most pressing policy questions. Uh, today's webinar presentation is, of course, uh, related to this set of, of uh, projects. All of these reports are now published and are available for you to access on our COVID hub, along with an array of other interesting content that relates uh, to the pandemic. Before I introduce today's topic and our speakers, I need to provide you with a few instructions just about how to use the software that we're hosting this webinar from, and also to do a little bit of housekeeping. So firstly, this webinar is being recorded. If you want to return to it later, or if you want to share it uh, with colleagues, then the recording will be on the Ahuri website. Uh, if not today, then um, in, in coming days. At the end of today's webinar, you will be sent a survey uh, we welcome your feedback and this helps us to refine and improve uh, future webinars and other offerings and um, we're interested to know your thoughts about this one. In terms of participating in today's webinar, uh, here are the instructions on how to use uh, the software that you've got. Um, you're listening using your computer's speaker system by default. Um, if you'd prefer to uh, join in over your phone, then just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed there. You can call in. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions and you, you do that by typing your questions into the questions section of the control panel. Um, please submit your questions at any time uh, during the presentation uh, and we'll collate these and we'll address as many of them as we can during the Q&A segment, which will follow the presentation today. Uh, please disregard the raise your hand function. Uh, we won't be using that uh, in the webinar. Now, on to today's topic and presenters. Well, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, which is called The Lived Experience of COVID-19, Housing and Household Resilience. Our presenter today is Professor Ralph Horn from RMIT University. Ralph is the lead author of Ahuri's report, The Lived Experience of COVID-19, Housing and Household Resilience, which takes a longitudinal qualitative approach to examine differential impacts of COVID-19 for those in housing affordability stress across tenures, housing types, and different household compositions. The report, along with a policy evidence summary and a standalone executive summary, are now available uh, for you to download from the Ahuri website. And these documents are also provided through the webinar software as handouts, so you can um, get hold of them easily and have a look uh, right now if you need to. Ralph Horn is Professor of Geography and Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation for the College of Design and Social Context at RMIT. Ralph is interested in social and policy change to support sustainable urban development 
and has a specific research interest in equitable low carbon urban transitions, housing and households. To the webinar today, we also welcome Emma King and she will be a respondent following the research presentation. Emma has been the Chief Executive Officer of VCOS, the Victorian Council of Social Services, since 2013. Uh, providing a strong voice of leadership and advocacy on social justice for the community sector. Emma represents VCOS on a range of ministerial advisory groups and committees. She is also the chair of the Future Social Services Institute and president of the Farnham Street Neighbourhood Learning Centre and a board member of Mental Health Victoria. Uh, the format for today's webinar will include a short response from Emma following Ralph's research presentation. And after that, I will facilitate a discussion between our two participants and taking questions from you, uh, the audience. So please do, um, as I say, feel free to ask a question at any time throughout the webinar today by typing uh, your question into the questions part of the panel. And I will do my best to include your question in our Q&A session. Well, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Professor Ralph Horn uh, to give our presentation this morning. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks, Tom. Um, and thanks for that lovely introduction. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the lands um, uh, on which I'm uh, here today in, in Melbourne. Um, and I'll get, I'll get going because I think time is going to be against us. Um, and I should say from the beginning that um, uh, I mean, I, I, will, I will give a pretty brief overview of this research uh, project today. There's obviously more information available in the report, which I'll probably refer to on a number of occasions through the next 25 or 30 minutes or so. Um, I mean, I guess I would start as all good housing research should start by by noting housing as, you know, a primary site of, of everyday life and, um, uh, and, 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 and point out, I guess, the kind of obvious that that with COVID-19 that has taken on an extraordinarily increased significance um, uh, as we have all spent a lot more time at home um, and in a sense although that might sound rather a simplistic observation uh, what it does is shines a kind of an intense light on already existing inequalities across the housing system because as soon as um, we are all cooped up at home, we are cooped up with whatever we had or whatever we didn't have prior to the pandemic. Um, and so I, I guess from that, I would say as a, as a housing slash geographer, housing researcher slash geographer myself, my kind of expectations would be that those underlying uh, inequalities um, would somehow affect and affect um, coping mechanisms and responses uh, to not just the pandemic itself, but perhaps more importantly than that in some ways, or in most households, um, the government's response to try to control the pandemic, which of course was to have us um, working, um, schooling, learning, etc., uh, at home. Um, so just uh, really our starting point for this project, um, uh, in fact, I might ask you to go to the next slide um, and I just keep moving I'm, I'm on the introductory section. Thank you. Um, uh, we set ourselves out um, these four research questions at, at the beginning um, of the work. Um, we wanted to understand how are these kind of already uneven households impacted? Um, particularly with regards to care, health, work, schooling, relationships, access to outside spaces, energy bills, food and privacy. So not a long list, just basically everything. Um, and really, how do we get into this and why did we pick such a kind of broad, if you like, swathe of, um, uh, of everyday life? Well, I guess our starting point was that it's very difficult to disentangle these things and there are interdependencies between them. So our approach was to do qualitative research with a relatively smaller number of households spending more time with each one to try to understand these entanglements. Um, so we didn't set out to do a representative study, but we set out to find a range of households, in fact, 40 households, um, that would allow us to understand and tell 
uh, this complex story of interrelationships. That's the style of, and type of research we were doing. And it's, um, uh, you know, it, its power, I guess, is, is, in, um, is in therefore being able to get into those entanglements and relationships. Um, um, we wanted to then understand what coping mechanisms were being adopted by these households. And that introduced another challenge for the research because um, if, we're, if we're trying to understand what is being adopted, uh, then that suggests a kind of timeline where we need to know point A and point B and understand what's happened in between. So pre-pandemic, post-pandemic or during pandemic, what has happened? What kind of mechanisms have come into play? So that suggests the idea of longitudinal research. The problem is we didn't know the pandemic was going to happen. So we couldn't do stage one, um, which is pre-pandemic. So what we did was we went back, and I'll talk about this in more detail in a moment. We went back to two ARC grants that we've, we have, um, which involve us doing this style of qualitative research within households, one on apartments um, and another on um, more focused on detached housing, um, where we were looking at uh, low carbon energy retrofits. So, but, but the point is we had had these uh, semi-structured, extensive conversations face-to-face -face in people's dwellings in the two years, uh, two or two and a half years prior to the pandemic. So our, our ambition was to go back to those precise individuals and have a follow-up conversation about how their lives had changed over the past two and a half years. We actually didn't start the interview with the pandemic. We just... Uh, we just started it with how are things going. Um, so that was our way in to try to understand and try to avoid getting those kind of um, programmed narratives of self um, that don't necessarily, um, that we all have, that don't necessarily give us the insights that we were looking for. Um, so we really wanted to then understand what was the role of the government's policy interventions that I mentioned at, at various levels. Um, you know, were they working? How were they working? And what were the kind of um, challenges that it, householders were experiencing in accessing or um, benefiting from these 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 policy interventions? Um, and then what gaps did that leave? So that was really the framing of the of the study. And we can go to the next slide, please. So I've mentioned. Um, uh, here we go. Yep. Is there a slide between the two or have I got mixed up? No, no, that's okay. Sorry, that slide is absolutely fine. Um, so um, then we come to the sort of framing for for the, the, the study. Um, and here, of course, we had a group, four lead researchers involved in this study, all, um, all from uh, housing geography traditions. Um, we were trying to think of a way in which we could um, uh, theorize and understand then these these complex changes that are taking place and we um, we sort of did this uh, in 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 parallel with actually developing the research which was conducted over about three months it was all done fairly quickly um, and um, uh, we we landed on this um, this sort of um, schema which is based on I guess, um, a socio-material kind of resilience model drawn from kind of disaster risk uh, response and um, uh, literature. And um, in, a, in essence, there's kind of three elements, I guess. One is one is the kind of exposure factors. So so actually what's, what's happening um, in terms of changes uh, to, to care services, reductions in income, uh, disruptions in in daily practices, um, and in some cases, of course, fear of um, of infection, um, and then um, the sensitivity uh, to those to that to those uh, exposures, which included, of course, the age, pre-existing health conditions, pre-existing kind of social. Um, uh, social, um, I say sociableness, but um, uh, also, of course, the household consumption itself and 
and casualization aspects of job security precarity um, and then the third element of this is is their their capability so this is after kind of Amartya Sen's work on on capabilities their capability to respond in terms of uh, do they have the tools um, to get online and get access to new forms or new provision um, methods for healthcare, for example? Do they have social networks to be able to online to be able to replace those face-to-face -face social interactions that were lost? Um, do they have the financial resources to put those uh, things into place? And is there housing up to it, of course? Um, so this is the kind of framework uh, that we used and um, uh, across those two projects that I mentioned, um, we, um, we, re we recruited, uh, as I said, 40 uh, interviews, or actually 41 participants because one was interviewed as a couple um, across, uh, across the two projects more or less evenly, 19 and, and 21. So that meant that we got access to apartment stock and access to uh, the more sort of detached housing stock not only in Melbourne but also in um, regional Victoria down in the Latrobe Valley and this just happened to be the pattern of, of where we had people from those pre-existing studies um, uh, but, um, but we also selected them of course fairly carefully for a range of vulnerabilities and maybe you could go to the next slide please um, so um, yeah 28 women 13 men um, uh and 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 as i said a more or less even even split um uh, uh around 50 percent so 20 households were single person households and as i said we kind of selected them on the basis of uh, a set of what we expected to see as vulnerabilities so housing quality um housing suitability um affordability stress of various sorts um including energy poverty, um, income, uh, pre-existing health issues, although I should say and, 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 uh, and clarify that because our pre-existing projects and the skills of our team were not in the medical field, um, so we weren't qualified to specifically understand mental health or physical health issues. We just took a kind of, if, if you like, a layperson's um, informed view of pre-existing health conditions as we understood them, whether physical or mental, and self-reported uh, by the participant. And then and then those other factors to do with home, uh, whether it's tenure insecurity um, or you know a range of kind of neighborhood factors um, to do with location and services and, 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 and the like. Um, and our ambition, as I said, from the spirit of the study, from the approach of the study was to uh, identify a range of participants, the widest range that we could possibly find. Um, and we ended up with um, uh, with 15 households in, in Moreland, seven in Melbourne, four in Port Phillip, three Kingston, um, one each in, in um, Glen Ira, Bayside, Wyndham, and six in the Latrobe Valley. So that gives you a general idea of the kind of spread. Um, and, and um, of course, one of the flaws or, or challenges of longitudinal type research, I wouldn't call this kind of fully longitudinal, but it has a longitudinal aspect to it, um, is that people move house and mess things up. Um, uh, um, I'm, I'm joking, of course. So 12 of our interviewees had actually changed residence, but we included them because we re really weren't that we weren't focused on the physical materiality of the dwelling. Um, we were focused on um, households responses to the pandemic. So it wasn't a limitation of our study that some of those people had moved house. Um, uh, we were still able to reconnect with them. Um, and, and literally it was the original interviewers that made contact with them. So there was continuity in, in the study, which we felt was important. Um, so I think that's probably oh, the only other thing to say about the the study design itself, of course, is that um, and there's a timeline in the report. Um, obviously, it took place. Uh, the data collection took place in in June and July. So this was a specific point 
uh, in the pandemic when, as we all know, those of us in Victoria at least, um, that uh, there was a lot going on um, and further restrictions associated with the infamous second spike uh, were being implemented during that period. Um, uh, so I think that's really important and I think that, you know, um, you could envisage multiple uh, points at which you would um, uh, want to do this type of research at various points during the pandemic to try to understand how these lived experiences change over time. We had that snapshot window um, and of course there have been uh, changes uh, implemented since then um, and in fact um, as you know the peak of the second wave was really probably August, September um, and that, that, that by that time we had um, we had finished data collection. We were analyzing the data in August. So um, I think that's important to point out. And perhaps the other thing is about semi-structured interviews. I'm sure many people know this already, but just to say that um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we, we didn't start by talking about COVID. We didn't start by saying specifically, how have you been affected? We knew that would elicit kind of uh, more narrative automated responses and explanations that we were not so interested in. So we started um, with a, a, a set of questions that was to do with uh, following up on what we'd last spoken to them about, whether it was about their retrofit plans in their detached dwellings, or whether it was to do with um, the nature and design of their apartment and how they were adapting to it. And um, then the conversation moved on to how they were keeping in touch with friends and family, how they were coping with rent, mortgage, energy bills, what their internet access was like, how their, if they were renters, how contact with landlords uh, might have been um, sustained or, or changed. And then questions around urban spaces and access, um, around social networks, service access. So we didn't really front up with kind of COVID pandemic. Uh, we fronted up really with uh, uh, this continuity. And, and that was, deliberately designed to elicit genuine kind of lived experience um, and um, and obviously was based on on having empathy and understanding of the already existing context within which those uh, those interview participants found themselves. Um, so uh, next slide please. So yeah on to research findings and um, what we did um, uh, I guess faced with an astonishing amount of data, um, uh, we chose to um, it, it analyze this data um, and, and eventually landed on these kind of four thematic areas um, uh, that we organized the analysis in in the report. And I'll just briefly go through the key findings out of each of those. Um, uh, now, in, 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 in the time available and enough at least hopefully to start a conversation. Um, uh, so yeah, um, in essence, you know, I, I guess confirming the fact that housing became this, you know, almost, um, uh, I guess, uh, the center of everybody, everybody's life like it had never been before. Um, uh, the uh, and accepting the fact that housing was probably not currently organized in a way that provided any kind of universality of access of sanctity of security or of livability for that matter um but that there, there were these existing inequalities um you know we we, we weren't uh, we weren't really surprised to find that people living in lower density detached housing with income security and online social networks that were well developed, they had use of a car, um, were at some advantage overall. Uh, they were able to uh, either embark upon or expand hobbies such as gardening um, and, uh, and, and to kind of focus in on, on house, ha family, household and their local area. Um, on the other hand, of course, for those in poorer quality, poorly situated uh, dwellings with few local services that were perhaps also lower density, 
um, the lived experience was 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 more about spending a lot of time in cold, uninsulated, uh, poorly heated homes, or needing to use public transport as key workers to uh, to access essential work, um, even though they were battling well-founded anxieties about contamination. Um, and so, uh, and then of course there were those in in high-rise apartments um, where who probably selected and, and in many cases had selected their apartment location on the basis of not needing a backyard because there's parks, not needing um, a fancy kitchen because there's plenty of access to food. Thank you. I should have said go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, uh, and 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 were suddenly uh, finding themselves in a situation where they were literally confined in in pretty small shoebox type apartments that were never really designed for this level of occupancy um, and to produce uh, things like physical exercise, um, uh, home provisioning of various sorts. Um, so that was the kind of, in a sense. Um, not rocket science conclusion, but uh, or finding, but uh, but but then from there, as I said, we dug into these four areas. So starting with employment, income, housing, finances, and local services, um, it was very clear to us um, that um, the support measures were critically important uh, in supporting household resilience. And again, I can't say this enough: uh, the efforts. Um, of, of various governments um, through this period have been rightly challenged and questioned. Um, uh, but one, one thing about the COVID support payments, um, and of, of those I would, I would particularly single out from our interviews, um, the job uh, seeker payments. Obviously JobKeeper were also important, they were just less featured in our respondents and uh, our participants. But the top up uh, to um, uh, in the form of the job seeker payments, which are now, of course, are being basically phased out uh, step by step, um, um, were 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 critical, um, and they, in many ways, kind of transformed people's lives. They enabled them to, for example, uh, access things that um, they weren't able to prior to the pandemic. Um, but they they did they did leave some gaps. So, for example. Um, for, for people who um, were very much in the informal economy and perhaps weren't accessing um, uh, Centrelink payments pr prior to this, where those informal sources of income were cut off by the pandemic, um, of course they were left in, in, in even worse poverty than they were prior. Um, so there were gaps, but, but ultimately this safety net was was robust um, and provided for many who many vulnerable households um, a, a literally a, a, a form of a form of support that was critical. Um, uh, but the other thing to say, of course, is that in terms of local services, um, uh, we all discovered because it hit the front pages if we didn't know already um, that some some places don't have any decent parks within five kilometres. Uh, which is um, which is a pretty uh, serious indictment for one of the world's most livable cities, apparently. Um, so we were kind of alerted to this fact of of the distribution of what we might call urban services, whether it's access to parks, access to uh, access to all kinds of services, um, are unevenly distributed, and and that's a big job to retrofit a city um, in a more equitable way. Um, I'll maybe come back to that later, but I'd better keep moving. So maybe onto the next slide, which was um, really uh, the second part of this was about working from home um, and what was happening inside the dwelling. Um, and, um, and, and as our lives collapsed into the dwelling, uh, this of course happened une unevenly and it, and it um, uh, and the responses uh, were remarkable um, and, and, and incredible levels of ingenuity. Um, but you know, it, it has to be, I mean, I, I remember one respondent, for example, who was an artist, a performing artist, had constructed a stage uh, in their front room so that they could actually do 
uh, performances online. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, it's just um, uh, an example, but um, but clearly, you know, grocery shopping patterns, um, cooking and food related practices fundamentally changed. There was an explosion in, 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 in online food delivery and packaging associated with that. And um, who knows what footprint implications there, but um, also the fact that the burden of labor uh, tended to fall unevenly and disproportionately, um, uh, and 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 so yeah, I, I guess here I'm really trying to tell a story which came across very strongly of incredible ingenuity, incredible in in many cases resilience, um, uh, but also uh, in the face of uh, really quite uneven uh, challenges that that householders uh, faced, um, and um in in essence this is about how pre-existing skills knowledge learned practices resources were harnessed and brought to bear to deal with what was happening whether that's in the form of picking out blankets or um find, uh, ways to provide warmth through what was for many people a very long cold winter um cooped up at home when normally during the winter uh, they would be spending large amounts of those winter days um, in other warmer uh, indoor places um, that were no longer accessible um, due to due to COVID. Um, so um, there are a number of kind of photos in the report that you can access showing uh, kind of responses, uh, the diversity of kind of responses. Um, but I think uh, because of time, I'll move on to the third, uh, which was really about relationships, um, which I'll just very briefly touch on. Um, and I think here I would say, um, and there's a slide just following this, um, there's, um, I mean, uh, I think everybody's been, everybody's been affected by isolation. The question is, um, and, and coming back to the schema um, that we were using, uh, the extent, I guess, of exposure to those isolating. Um, so many were able to keep their jobs, even if they were online working from home, or they were going out and having some kind of social interaction, even if they were essential workers. Um, the sensitivity, so pre-existing kind of uh, tendencies to either use um, uh, uh, to, to social um, channels, um, and all pre-existing conditions and so on. And then, then those capabilities that I've mentioned, and, and they really uh, helped us to explain the, the, the huge variation. Uh, and we met households who, um, who, who frankly, uh, and this is without any medical training on my part, but frankly came across to me as being um, really at the point of um, desolation, really, uh, really lacking connection. They, we included uh, participants who had lost loved ones during the pandemic and weren't able to to give them the sort of send off that they would have expected to because of the constrictions around funeral arrangements um, were cut off from their own families that they depended on, not just practically for support with shopping and driving and so on, but um, but frankly um, that was their that was their intimate link with the outside world. Um, uh, so again, a very mixed picture. Um, and and um, I'll, I'll move to the I'll move to the final, which was which was focused on health. And um, uh, again, I, I would say start off with the kind of the, the, the more obvious observations that um, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the imposition, I guess, of the of the restrictions um, uh, had different consequences um, for people's social, physical, and mental health, depending on the dwelling they started out in in the in the neighbourhood. Um, uh, apartments um, uh, were, um, uh, you know, generally more constrained internally in terms of the private space, um, but there were very a, a, a wide diversity of apartments. Some uh, some were managed very proactively um, and um, enabled uh, 
um, uh, very efficient infection control and uh, uh, lifts to be operated safely, et cetera, et cetera. And people felt that um, access, ingress, and, and, and control over the over the um, over the shared spaces um, was something that they felt confident about. Others were at the opposite end of that particular kind of spectrum, where they felt that as soon as they opened the door from their apartment. Uh, there was potential contamination everywhere they looked um, and there wasn't a managed environment in those interstitial spaces between the street and the front door of the apartment. Um, so again, opportunities there to think about policy going forward, which I'm about to just finish on. Um, but yeah, the um, uh, I, 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 I guess um, I'll leave it there and develop some of these observations in the questions, um, just because I'm conscious of time and go on to just make some closing remarks about the implications for policy. Um, so um, there's, I think there's two further slides. Um, so we're nearly there. Um, and the uh, first one I've said five, there are actually six uh, development options just to keep you guessing. Um, the um, first one, I guess I, I flagged this already, so I'll be brief, is around financial support. Um, I singled out uh, the job seeker um, uh, supplement uh, as being uh, something that um, I mean this this allowed, for example, people who had been um, on some form of uh, very low income um, for many years to make improvements to their home with these five hundred and fifty dollar uh, fortnightly payments uh, to actually build build buy materials. Um, fix up their homes for energy efficiency. It involved people, it enabled people to go and eat a healthy diet um, that they otherwise um, felt unable to do uh, because of their budget. Um, so these are pretty fundamental um, and um, certainly lifted the spirits of the poorest in our in our community um, at, at a time when that was badly needed. Um, so I think um, uh, there are lessons there for uh, for the future in terms of the level of um, job seeker payments. Um, secondly, cleanliness, um, and of course things have happened so quickly during this pandemic that one easily forgets um, in a given month what was the kind of expectation narrative. I mean, this uh, data collection period was one when masks had not become yet uh, universal in Victoria and yet now we all live with masks and we perhaps are a bit unsure when we need to use them now because of the re relaxing of, of, of those regulations. But um, So it's about a snapshot in time but look at this point um, we particularly found um, uh, that um, the concerns around cleanliness were mainly to do with multi-unit dwellings which I've just alluded to, and public transport, which I mentioned earlier. And this points to a need for kind of increased powers and monitoring of social distancing, of cleanliness, uh, and, and, and the ability to provide concrete reassurance to those vulnerable residents and public transport users that things are all good and it's actually safe uh, to do, um, to, to, to move around the curtilage of their apartment or it's safe to get on public transport and use it. Um, um, third area, urban design. So in, in a sense, and I've mentioned this already, so I won't talk much about this. Um, it's a kind of, I guess, the hardy perennial of urban planning, unevenness across the city, whether you choose the term gentrification or, uh, or whatever. The fact is uh, urban services vary quite significantly from place to place and that becomes a real problem when you're stuck in one place and that place does not have urban services. Um, uh, so needless to say, that is a, ret a city retrofit question um, for the future and a reminder that, um, uh, that for us to redouble our efforts in the policy space um, to address this unevenness of urban services across the city. Um, the last slide um, and the other three um, policy development areas, well, first of all, I guess I have to say something about building design. Um, uh, again, wide variety of apartments, some of that was uh, apartments experiences, some of that was management, but some of it was physical material design. Um, you know, size of lifts, um, actually the design of those kind of uh, mixture, uh, uh, sort of um, 
circulation space areas um, and um, yeah, so and floor plates um, uh, arrangements um, which um, which do or don't allow for those kind of home working unplanned um, needs out of housing um, and, and, and the most obvious one for detached dwellings of course is the um, energy efficiency um, and the fact that um, the fact that many of those uh, detached dwellings that lower income households find themselves in are really not fit for purpose um, and a lack of kind of mandated or otherwise structural approaches to fixing up energy efficiency in dwellings is 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 exacerbating the impacts of the pandemic um, and then um, community cohesion I think I, I suppose I'd sum this up in a sentence by saying that um, uh, the pandemic has helped focus uh, minds uh, on the fact that in a way community cohesion is an essential service um, and actually uh, is a preventative uh, intervention uh, to enable households to be more resilient in the face of future disasters. Um, uh, and then fi finally, social housing, uh, another reminder, I guess, of the need to reimagine social housing, which has been a long running policy question, of course, in many Western countries, not least Australia and here in Victoria, a need to urgently expand the stock and think about its flexibility in terms of design and think about the questions of tenure and of status and of the affordances of quality of design um, that have dogged in a sense social housing um, um, and of course now we have an announcement from the state government to invest in social housing and the big question is going to be what does that look like and how will that pan out over the coming months um, as it as it manifests um, so look I'll leave it there I think I'm pretty much over time and um, back to you Tom Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ralph. Really appreciate um, that great presentation of the research and your findings. And um, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that report is on our website and also available um, as a handout uh, for, for everyone uh, participating today uh, to be able to read afterwards and follow up. And also, I did mean to acknowledge earlier, of course, um, Ralph's co-authors, um, Nicola Vyland, Louise Dorignon, and Bhavna Mida, who um, also worked on and co-authored that report. Um, thanks, Ralph. And I'm now going to hand over to Emma King, and Emma's going to reflect um, on the, the project and the, the outcomes uh, in relation particularly to her sector. Thanks, Emma. Thank you very much, Tom and Ralph. Uh, if I also can begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we all meet today, albeit in our virtual circumstances, uh, I am meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging um, to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Uh, Tom, I'd like to congratulate you and your team for the COVID-19 series. It's fantastic. And uh, Ralph, you and your team for the fantastic report that we're talking about today. Uh, I guess one of the things that I, that really struck me when I was fortunate enough to get an early glimpse um, at the report as well is that looking at that alongside other work that we're undertaking is the um, really, I guess the sort of obvious thing in a way is that COVID has magnified a number of the existing um, inequalities and frailties that already um, existed in our society. And I don't think, uh, whilst we've known that housing has been an issue for my lifetime, um, I don't think we've ever had this level of emphasis on housing. And I think particularly during, you know, COVID, not only did we see existing issues being magnified, but also when you think around the very, very strong messaging that we were given, and that was stay safe and stay home. Uh, and again, we've not had that sort of message, I think, um, before. So yet we know for many people, what we're told to stay safe and stay home, for many people, that actually wasn't possible. It wasn't possible because they, um, you know, in terms of the type of home that they were living in, because of family violence situations, because of significant health issues that were exacerbated by where they were living in, as, as is detailed in um, significantly through the report. 
um, energy bills, and I'll come to that a little bit more in a, in a while as well, knowing that some homes are particularly energy inefficient. And also the flip side of that of knowing, we know actually through some other research we've undertaken with RMIT and others, um, around the under usage of energy because people are so scared they can't pay their bills that therefore they don't turn their heater on in winter and they literally end up in hospital with hypothermia. Literally, they die and it's quite, it's, um, it's extraordinary. Um, overcrowding, the fact that people are unable to afford rent and I do want to touch on a couple of the points that were made in the report around that as well. Lack of access to food, digital divide um, and we know that for many as well they did have a home. Um, and I think this is one of the other parts that I just thought was youth, useful to touch on because we know that for many, many people, they live on the street, they live in a car, they live in very overcrowded um, facilities. So the concept of being told to stay safe and stay home, uh, I thought that was really interesting watching how that played out over time um, because suddenly these issues that have existed for a forever probably were and, and we've seen probably increased visibility over recent months as well. Suddenly these issues have been at the forefront of the minds of the decision makers and people who are actually making funding decisions around actually what do we need to change? What do we need to change to keep people safe even though it was never safe to live in that way um, in the first instance? And going to the interrelationships that Ralph you and your team have really drawn on in the report as well. So I think uh, there are a few issues I thought were really worth mentioning in terms of, as you've mentioned, um, at the very outset of the pandemic, that um, the job around job seeker, and as you mentioned, job keeper, and I too will focus more on job seeker. But suddenly we found because people were losing their jobs who never thought that they would lose their job, suddenly we saw the amount of job seeker being increased overnight, which we were told would never happen. It was too expensive. We couldn't possibly do it. And yet it was an overnight decision because people were going, I can't live on that amount of money. You've got to be kidding me. How on earth can I do that? So it, I think there's an interesting point there, which I'll come to sort of towards the end as well around political will and the fact that people fund what they value. And there's definitely a deserving and a non-deserving lens from my perspective that has played over that for literally 25 years. And we've seen no increase in new start. Um, I think in terms of also looking at the fact, I should note as well, obviously, which I think you did also, Ralph, that um, there were there were people who missed out. So for example, um, migrants on temporary protection visas who are literally lining up for food around the corner to get assistance and have been just dreadfully um, and inexplicably neglected during COVID as well. We also saw, and, and whilst this may be imperfect, what we also saw is another thing that we were told was never possible. And that was what homeless people being moved into accommodation, whether that's being moved into hotels or other accommodation. And really, we, this is something people have been pitching for to some time to say, it's not okay to live like this, but we've been told really, it's kind of a bit too hard. And we, we don't think we can, you know, from political levels, we, we don't really see what else is possible. And what we'd seen was a huge will to actually go, this isn't okay, what are we gonna to do to change it? And I know there's some underlying issues that sit alongside that, but nonetheless, when we look at the, the sort of the premise of that, I think it's pretty, um, it is a seismic um, shift. Uh, we also saw the importance of community sector organisations. And I guess as uh, someone who's fortunate enough to live and breathe this, this is something that we see all the time and it's really profound in emergencies. And I think of Hazelwood, I think of fires and floods, et cetera. We see it all the time. When we have periods of disasters, people want to go to the people that they know and that they trust that often isn't government um, and that's not take, it's not having a go at government, it's, it's people in the local neighbourhood house, it's people at your community um, health centre, it's people that you know and you trust and there's a couple of things I wanted to draw on there and one is that often those community services, they're vitally important, they're, they're very poorly funded as a general rule and often they're dealing with the disaster in and of themselves and we saw that in this case where neighbourhood houses by and large were not allowed to have people uh, in, but nonetheless, they're doing lots of fine outreach work and doing their best to connect to members of the community in lots of various ways, um, as with community housing organisations. And, and as one example, the work they're doing on various housing estates, which isn't only about theoretically, you're there to take your COVID test, or you are there to, to take someone's COVID test, but they'll also have a chat to people about how are they going and how is their mental health and do they need food and those sorts of things that actually do some of the joining of the dots. It's not just a transactional piece, it's actually a really meaningful piece. 
I would note that in the research we've undertaken though, we have seen a number of community sector organisations that have drawn on their own reserves to be able to give the services that communities need because they were not funded um, for that work. And I think that's an interesting piece that probably goes a step further than your research, but I just thought it was, it's information that we've gained through a recent piece of research that we've undertaken that was useful to share here as well. So I think for me, much of the pandemic, it showed things that we already um, know, but it put it up in lights. And I think that's really interesting. It impacted people who probably thought they were okay and these things would never happen to them. So we saw literally industries falling apart where people, one day they were doing well, the next day the bottom fell out of their world, which is, is devastating and not something we would ever want to happen. But we suddenly saw this increased desire to want to address change that maybe people had been able to walk past before or felt quite isolated from uh, before. So looking, I think, at getting the attention of our MPs, the sort of collective decision makers, and that I guess the image is that people aren't going to forget in a hurry, like those queues that are circling around Centrelink before daybreak had even begun, that doesn't go away, I don't think. That feeling doesn't, does, doesn't leave. And, and I think they were really... Um, pivotal moments in times of when decisions were made. And the catch for me is, how do we take the good that came from some of that decision-making and how do we not lose it? I wanted to talk a little bit about, I think what is the strong interrelationship between things that I picked up in the report and some work that VCOS has been undertaking, I know others have as well, and that is about wellbeing. And that's about more broadly a wellbeing budgeting process and a wellbeing economy. Um, as we know, economic prosperity in and of itself is not a good measure. Um, of the well-being of a community. Um, you can have a AAA credit rating, but you can have, as we did before COVID, 100,000 people who are waiting for a home on a public housing waiting list, enough people to fill an MCG. So actually, how do we address that as a community? And I'm, I mention it because it's strong advocacy work we're undertaking, but I think it connects very strongly with the work uh, that Ralph and his team have undertaken as well. Uh, we've seen that framework around how you work towards a greater good in other jurisdictions, be it New Zealand, um, Scotland, Iceland and others, and I think it's gaining real traction um, more broadly across the world as well. Um, the argument for more social housing has always been compelling. Um, and I think before, as I said, before COVID, we had huge waiting lists. And this report really demonstrates that critical, the critical interrelationship around the need for more social housing, but where it's built and the interdependencies between things like energy efficiency and those sorts of things. And one of the, um, oh, actually, one, and I guess, sorry, I'll, I'll jump to this in a moment, but you know, we know that, for example, looking at education, social housing, uh, health, uh, optimising health and the ability to afford the basics. It's really fundamental to life. It was fundamental before COVID, but again, I just want to point to the fact that I think it was really magnified during. So what we've seen, I think, is post-COVID is we've seen quite unprecedented ex uh, expenditure, investment, I would call it, um, in our community and, uh, and some interesting decisions. And I think there's a part here about what do we hold on to? Where are the opportunities and where do we kind of move in some areas into the implementation stage? So looking, for example, uh, at Job Seeker, as we mentioned earlier, where, and, and you touched on this, Ralph, in detail around the fact that, you know, we saw that doubled overnight. Now we're seeing it chipped away and taken away from. Yet yeah, the interesting thing is, I think this is an interesting piece about governments fund what they value. And when it comes to Job Seeker, we know that um, there's, there's lots of evidence to show the amount of money that people got through JobSeeker, it was invested straight back into the economy and it was invested back into essentials, into things that people needed. So what it actually did, ironically, was lift people who were in abject poverty actually out of abject poverty for a short period of time, which meant they could buy food, they could pay for their bills, they could buy their medicine, and it was money directly straight back into the economy again. And instead we've seen um, you know, tax cuts now for people who actually have got a job and are in that group that if you mentioned, well, they're doing fine, really, in a relative sense. So it's that interesting thing about what you chip away. Job seeker is an interesting piece in that I would say the design is imperfect, but nonetheless, really well intended and really interesting, I think, to think about what does that mean as we kind of step forward the next stages as well. And I do think in Victoria, we have a different lens. I speak to my colleagues in other states and I feel like I'm living on Mars in comparison. Um, the rental reforms, and I did want to touch on this a little bit as well, because 
I was interested in the research in your report, Ralph, and some of the data we've seen since that time. So there's over six, This and, and again, this isn't pretending. So I wanted to touch a bit because I know in your recommendation was kind of saying, look, I don't know if we should continue this. What I would say is that we've actually seen more recent data that shows there's been a significant uptake in terms of people actually accessing significant rental reductions, around 25% rental reductions. That came about with quite intentional work from government and a range of different community organisations, um, including Tenants um, Uni Victoria who have funded to undertake the work ourselves. Um, some of the real estate, um, some of the agencies were great, others were perhaps dragged a little bit more to the table. Uh, but we now have, there's well over 60,000 people or 60,000 households that have got rental reductions of around, this is a mean I think of about 25%. And in September we saw a rapid up, up sort of tick um, in terms of the number of households who are able to take on um, the rental reductions. Um, and there were less deferrals because that's obviously one of the things we're worried about. We don't want people deferring rent that they actually have got the capacity to pay as well. But I wanted to point to that because it was one of the things that shifted from the time that you undertook your um, research. Um, I think there's a really important piece there about addressing homelessness more broadly and some of the work that government has undertaken on that front that will require more work. And then obviously the significant um, announcements made through budget around um, social housing, noting that the social, the new social housing, which is an unprecedented spend, is seven star energy efficiency, but also the other energy announcements that have been made there. And in my mind, I think it's really interesting. So I'm wondering, you know, of the last budget that we saw, the very recent budget of what quite seismic spending, I don't think we would have seen that without COVID. So I think that's really interesting in terms of looking at actually what's brought a number of issues that we have all, I suspect on this call, we've all fought for years and yet it's interesting that it is a pandemic that's actually brought these issues to the forefront and there's a, I don't know, a question in my mind about whether they would have been if it were not for some pretty dreadful and awful circumstances. Um, so I guess I just wanted to point to the fact there's huge opportunities around social housing, energy, a whole host of things that were in the recent state budget. It's around the part of what do we keep and what do we lose in terms of looking at um, a whole host of other issues around digital divide, et cetera, that I think have you know got a great need to be addressed. Food security, huge issues that continue to, uh, to be addressed, but huge opportunities. There's, I think, a big question for us all as we move into implementation and um, also looking at the sort of political will to keep things like job seeker up at a higher rate that actually lift people out of abject poverty in a way that's just um, inexcusable and not losing that. And I guess I just wanted to touch on the fact that I think the report is just invaluable in terms of being there as really um, strong, robust research um, from a fantastic team that's actually going to, I think, really help guide uh, the way forward from here. So a bit of unfinished business, as you mentioned, Ralph, in terms of, well, sounds, that actually sounds really, um, flipping around things like precarious work, which is a really a real blight on our society, you know, funding of community sector organisations and job seeker. So unfinished business on that front, but huge opportunities on others. And I think huge opportunities as we move to the implementation stage that you would hope would pick up on the recommendations that you and your team have made, Ralph. So that's probably um, Tom, my, my comments in summary and thank you for the opportunity. You're very, very welcome, Emma. Thanks. Um, appreciate your reflections on the report and the insights you've presented there. Um, I'm going to invite uh, you, Emma, to stay um, live with your microphone there and Ralph to turn yours on too if you haven't already. And um, and we'll have a bit of a discussion now and, and take some uh, questions from the floor too. And I'll just um, also prompt people to um, be um, submitting questions so that we can uh, discuss them over the next little while. Um, but I'm just going to ask the first one really um, just I guess to acknowledge the fact that um, I'm sitting here in Melbourne and indeed um, both of you are and uh, and our conversation has um, focused on Victoria and, and Melbourne specifically but of course we have people um, tuning in from around Australia and also even from overseas and um, I just wondered if you could initially um, provide some reflection and I appreciate um, you know this you know obviously the research was focused uh, here in in Melbourne and Victoria but if you could just give some I guess um, uh, response or, or thought both of you as to I guess um, how this fits into particularly a, a sort of bigger 
um, national picture, to what extent what, um, what we've been discussing and what's been found through this project um, is uh, relatable to other Australian contexts especially. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe Ralph, if you go first, uh, but I'd like to hear what you both think of that, thanks. Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Emma, for your remarks, which um, uh, I found very, very, very useful and, and, and very constructive. And, and you're absolutely right, um, by the way, um, in terms of the rent reductions, the big issue that we found at that point was was the deferrals question. So people could see, uh, rightly, that this wasn't going to go away in a month or two. And they could see debt piling up if they went down the rent deferrals route and they didn't want that and I don't blame them. Um, and and um, But you're absolutely right now, uh, subsequent to this research, the take up, and I hadn't realized it got 60,000, which is fantastic, um, has been quite robust of rent reductions and also those $3,000 payments. And I think that that's making a huge difference. Um, but look, to, to, to the question, uh, Tom, I think, um, I, I mean, I think the implications of this, and again, Emma alluded to this, but I, I think Victoria's did it tough, as the politicians like to say, um, and, and went through this second wave. And what can we get out of that? What's the learning? How can we do things differently? So that, I think, you know, the upside of that, and I, I'm not that fond of talking about silver linings, when people have died in their hundreds. Um, uh, but I will say we have to, even in their memory, do something differently um, and try to reorganize things in ways that would have prevented or reduced uh, the impact of living in pandemic times if and when this happens, it's probably a when, in the future. Um, and at the same time, address things that we have not been getting round to and um, I'll go with Emma's explanation without putting words in your mouth that this is about political will so let's get that political will now before it goes away put it to good use and I think that's maybe where in Victoria we can uh, we can talk to a broader audience about how um, uh, we can try to repurpose uh, what was a really tough time into um, into a policy environment um, that we know is going to produce economic benefits as well as critically social and environmental benefits um, for the whole of society. Um, and I should also say, of course, that this research did not include as far as, well, there were no uh, respondents who reported specific family violence. Um, there were no, no people on TPVs and we had no homeless participants. Those three, and we've noted this in the report, are all crucial, as Emma's pointed out, uh, and, and sadly for us, because of the fact that we could only fish in the pond of existing participants from previous studies, we weren't able to include just because of the design of our study. But, but I also think what I'm saying applies to all of the vulnerable sections of society, including those three groups specifically. We do know that family violence has spiraled. Um, and in a sense, it is predictable. Uh, all of the preconditions for this to happen were built into the pandemic response. So how do we prevent that from happening in the future? Um, and I think we can do, uh, or we can at least minimize the impact um, by planning for it. So I do think that there's a lot to take away from this experience. Um, and look, the respondents in this study can speak for themselves. And that's why we've tried to include as many um, quotations and photographs as we can to show that people know this on the ground. Um, they don't need policymakers or us necessarily um, uh, to tell them. Um, this is, a, this is a, a wider societal problem. It's pretty well understood. And it's about policy and political priorities in getting those right as we go into the future. So I might leave my response there. I'm happy to take any more specific questions, of course. Of course. Thanks. I Emma. might um, jump in and I might add on to the part where you finished actually, Ralph, which is around, it's almost the what we don't know yet from people in terms of looking at the fact we're in this sort of so-called COVID normal space and we know we're continuing to shift. And one of the things that um, 
has struck me during that time is that, for example, when we look at service adaptation, so if I looked at telehealth, for example, so in a way, what an extraordinary example, something that was intended to play out, I think, over a 10 year period and instead played out over 10 days. We know that's worked incredibly well for members of our society, but we also know that there are others that for which it hasn't. And yep. if I look at the efficacy around a number of the shifts to the IT platforms in terms of the ones we're all on today, we know, for example, some people are desperately left behind because they don't have internet connectivity and we're not sure about parts of that yet. So in terms of looking, for example, you know, for people who've got, for, it was one example, a mental health issue, actually, what does that feel like? If you're communicating with someone online when you might want to see them in person, uh, who gets left behind equally? For others, it might be a benefit. And one of the things that struck me in terms of the broader research pieces that have been done so far, and we did one around um, how uh, community service um, engagement, and we had intended, kind of similar to what you're describing, Ralph, in that it was in the first wave, and we at that time were not really thinking about the second wave. So we planned it that we would work with community sector organisations to see how they had adapted during that first wave. So we could pick up you know, mm -hmm. what had worked well, what hadn't, but also to work with. Um, and I don't like the term service users, um, but but mm. for want of a better term. Yep. Um, but we had planned to touch base with, with, with clients, well, people basically who utilise services, and we didn't get the chance to do that. And I think that that piece is missing more broadly. And I think it's missing in terms of we don't know yet who's gone under the radar. And I think there's a significant piece there for us all to undertake in the future. Um, I, I'd go back then, I think the piece around COVID normal is really important because I think I just attended an event, it was my first event since um, COVID had lifted and it was um, at a fairly big hall with my daughter's dance concert and every second row there were like groups of us sitting well apart with our masks on and just thinking, gee, how different this is and what does it mean for connectivity for those of us who've got, who are lucky enough to have kids playing sport because plenty of people can't afford it in the first place. but how different it is around the number of kids allowed into venues and parents, only one parent, for example. It's very different. It's a very new world that we're facing now. And I do wonder about the inequalities being made more stark. Um, in that space, I note the vouchers that, um, for those of you who are not Victorian, our, our state government just announced some vouchers for kids who are low income to enable them to play sport. But I think around the, the parts that help keep us connected, um, that have fallen away during COVID and, uh, the things that bring us back together as a community. And if you look at any given year in Victoria, about 10,000 kids drop out of school. Gee, what is that going to mean post COVID when most people have been remote for a good part of the year? I did want to touch again on the political will because I think it's really important. And I, I look at areas like job seeker and see it being tapered um, back. Um, and also, I guess the strength of our systems. I read Catherine Murphy's piece in The Guardian around uh, job seeker and the reason mm. that it was enacted fundamentally, I believe, through the tax office was because actually Centrelink can't cope. I might be making a generalisation, but I believe that's the case. It was efficient and there's a, you know, so I think there's a piece there about actually our systems and having systems in place that serve people. Um, and just knowing, I don't think we're going to snap back. You know, when we hear all of the mm. political commentary from the Prime Minister about snapping back, I, I don't think that's true. And I don't know that we want to snap back because actually what we had before wasn't great. So. I want to make the most of the opportunities we've got and I do really want to shift some of that. I think perhaps because of what we've been through in Victoria, I feel like we can do that, make that real shift towards broader, you know, well-being for every Victorian and well-being for every Victorian community. That's what I would love to see going forward and actually sort of dictating the sort of choices, et cetera, that we make um, through that sort of political will and we call on governments to make for, uh, and and we, we make as a society. Thanks. Mm. Great, thanks both. Um, we've got a question here from actually one of our international participants uh, who's listening in from um, from Glasgow, and it's a it's a bit of a technical question, Ralph, for you regarding the research, and it relates to the, um, the I guess that framework diagram that you showed in one of your first slides that um, yep. where you pointed out um, how you'd drawn on um, I guess disaster planning research and other. Um, literature like that uh, as a way of framing uh, what you were doing. Um, yep. So the the questioner um, suggests that you know this this reminded them also of Giddens um, structuration theory, and uh, the question um, is asks you to say a little more a bit about how um, sensitivity um, was operationalized in 
your work. And there's a bit of a, a further explanation of that saying, they're thinking here about uh, individual behaviours and risks versus um, structural social harms. Um, are you able to respond to that, please, Ralph? Yeah. Yeah, um, to some extent, although it's, 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 there's quite a bit of depth in that in that question. I would accord with most of the assumptions that were made, um, uh, and then hone in on this subject of, of sensitivity. We we tended to apply this in terms of what we were trying to do to to make sense of the data at a structural level. But obviously, uh, then uh, as as we as we looked at each individual each individual respondent and um, what they were able to tell us about those structural sensitivities that we had in mind that we were looking for, I don't know, casualness or precarity of work as an example, um, we were able to then uh, contextualise what we considered to be um, uh, those sensitivity factors in each individual case um, and, um, and, and that you know, stepping back into the helicopter and looking down on the framework, we could then sort of see how individual cases not only had different sensitivities, but had different, different uh, the, sen the sensitivity, if you like, dimension um, of resilience had a different amplitude, a different magnitude uh, in different cases. Um, and of course, it was when it was when those sensitivities were relatively amplified. Um, so, for example, there were pressures within the household pre-existing. There were already uh, job security uh, issues happening, um, and uh, there were already pre-existing health conditions. When that coupled with um, multiple exposures and 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 um, challenges in terms of capability respond, that's when we saw the kind of, if you like, the, the circumstances of collapse of resilience, which of course the flip side of resilience as we've defined it is vulnerability. Um, so that's how we apply the framework fairly pragmatically and definitely of course I would agree, structurations sitting on the on the back of it. Um, but you know, um, uh, you know I, I, yeah, I, I would sort of, maybe I'll leave it at that for now and, 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 and happy to go back to it um, if we if we have time. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks Ralph, I think that was a very good answer to that, uh, that question. Um, look, I want to now ask a question about um, I guess tenure and, um, and firstly um, uh, Emma, I guess just to clarify, you were talking earlier about um, the rent reductions and, and giving us some data around that. I, I would, do I assume that that data is, is Victorian level data, is that right? Yeah, it is Victorian level and also um, keeping in mind as well, we had um, in Victoria specifically some additional legislation go through to, um, I guess, uh, broaden some of the protections for tenants. Keeping in mind, this was on the back of a number of um, protections that come in more generally around minimum standards. And when I do say minimum standards, uh, they're not... I, you know, I think most people would probably have assumed they already existed. Things like, you know, having a door that locks and a window that opens and a stove that works and a toilet that works. But um, nonetheless, they were not there prior. And having protections there for tenants to be able to ask for uh, reductions in their rent and also some, what then became some proactive outreach work. So for example, um, I don't know whether it was every tenant, certainly thousands of tenants received text messages saying, have you contacted your landlord? if you're in financial difficulty and ask for help, those sorts of things. So we saw some very proactive outreach work happening because the take up initially was low. And I think it went to the points that you found in your report, um, Ralph, in terms of, you know, there's a there's a significant power imbalance when you're a renter and you don't want to then yep. uh, lose your property. So I think uh, it's it's been interesting there. And I think also there was the part around fear of, well, if I defer my rent, then I'm going to have to come back and pay for it later, but I won't, if I don't have a job, I don't have a job. How am I going to be able to do that? So there was a real balancing part around, well, how do you stay safe and stay, stay home uh, if you're in a rental and you don't have a job and you can't actually pay the rent? So there was a significant balancing piece to play out um, in there. But we've seen, as I mentioned, it's over 60,000 um, people now who've sought assistance. Uh, the vast vast majority are for rental reductions, so permanent rental reductions, and, and we're seeing a fairly significant amount in there as well. Hmm. 
Mm. Ralph, what uh, uh, Ralph? Can I ask? Uh, yeah, what what you saw in terms of how uh, differences in uh, in tenure played out um, in relation to the work that you did? Well, I'll I'll be a bit crass and say in a rather predictable way. Um, mm. There, there is such an imbalance currently uh, in terms of uh, tenancy rights and tenancy laws uh, that it's unmistakable when you walk into a, or virtually as we did for this, uh, walk into a household that is a private rental, for example, compared to one that's owner occupier. Um, completely different way of talking about the dwelling, completely different options available for developing um, household resilience, and adaptation. Um, it's chalk and cheese, frankly. And I might actually embellish this point by um, talking about a point that I should have emphasized before, which I think is relevant, and that's retrofit. So um, uh, what we haven't got yet is mass retrofit, and mass retrofit for energy efficiency is so badly needed in this country, um, particularly in Victoria, which as we know, um, I mean, it's a bright sunny day here in Victoria, um, uh, but it hasn't been very often for the last six months. And um, it's a heating driven climate from housing point of view. Um, and most most of our housing. So yeah, um, I share with yourself, Emma, uh, fantastic news that, that, that the new social housing is gonna be seven star, but that's, that's going to be much less than 1% of our future housing stock. 99% of it we're already living in and it needs fixing up desperately. And the, the stuff that needs most of all fixing up is the private rental stock which is in a slightly worse condition than the owner occupied stock there isn't a massive difference and in fact the uh the often mentioned so-called split incentive is uh from some work i did some years ago not as big as perhaps we might think um but nevertheless the bottom line is the condition of the stock is terrible and it can be fixed up and it can be fixed up much more cheaply if we do it on a mass scale, we will develop proper jobs, proper quality, um, much better social employment, economic, and of course, most importantly, in, in, I guess in terms of energy efficiency, also um, climate and, um, and environmental uh, benefits. It's a win-win-win situation and it just requires political will. And I think there are, going back to the political will, um, there are still, people huffing and puffing over pink bats and we need to get over it and get on with the job. Um, and that applies across 10 years, but it, it's most critical in, in private rental where placing a, a responsibility on landlords uh, in, in a much expanded list of the list that Emma's just given is the obvious next phase um, for this. Hmm. Thanks. Can I ask now, um, and Ralph, I'll start back with you, um, about um, about housing type. Um, and obviously you made a distinction between detached houses predominantly and, um, and apartment uh, dwellings. And uh, I mean, can, can you give us, a, a, I guess, a bit more of a, I mean, a, a, you know, only looking, at, only looking at obviously at 40 households, but um, I, I guess a bit more of a, um, a nuanced understanding of, what you saw in terms of, I guess, particularly on this question of, of the thermal performance of, of buildings. I mean, you, you mentioned in your talk that the um, uh, the detached houses actually were um, uh, performing uh, particularly poorly. I'm interested mm. to know about the apartments and how they fared. Mm. Um, as you mentioned, they're not, they're, you know, they're not necessarily designed for the intensity of occupation that they have received no. over the last year. Uh, it's a good question. Yeah, it's a really good question, uh, Tom. Um, what I might do uh, to frame um, an answer to that is to say that um, our apartments were, because of the, the study that led to, to, to this, were necessarily built following um, the, the uh, millennium. So they were apartments that had been built in the last 10 years and, and in fact, in most cases, less. Um, so we didn't get into that six pack, eight pack post-war stuff or pre-war um, sort of unit, lower lower density, lower rise um, apartments. And that's an important distinction because much of that stock is in awful shape, just as bad as the contemporary 
uh, detached dwellings of that era. So I should clear that up. Um, and therefore we found um, a dreadful overheating problems, um, but because of the season uh, in which we did this round of interviews, um, they didn't tend to come to the fore um, in, in this round of interviews because it was, uh, it was winter. Um, but we knew from previous interviews we'd done in these apartments that they do suffer with overheating uh, in many cases, um, partly because of shared walls and the fact that they were built following um, the introduction of some forms of en energy efficiency regulation into the building code, <coughs> excuse me, they were, um, they were not suffering, generally speaking, uh, with winter cold. Um, but there are specific reasons for that, which I've just outlined. Um, in terms of the detached stock, of course, um, this goes back a long way and, and, and um, all, all detached stock has been messed around with to some extent. Um, and if it's over 50 years old or even over 30 years old, it's, it's probably dilapidated in some way, shape or form from its original condition. And if it's pre-1990, its original condition was really zero energy efficiency. So um, we're dealing with a lot of stock that's been neglected over a long period of time that was never built for today's levels of what we know about disease and, and, and the importance of indoor temperatures and humidity control. Um, and and is therefore uh, a long way away from being fit for purpose. So that's why my my focus there um, is on private rental detached um, and and private rental owner occupied stock where where there's no cash flow. Um, but as I said, the the thing about scale um, is that it's uh, it's much cheaper um, at the unit cost. Um, and um, and it provides for rapid learning. So if even if a scheme was targeted at low income households, better off households would benefit from it because they'd be able to also uh, co-contribute and get better quality uh, retrofits and outcomes from this industry learning and, and scale. So I do think that that's kind of where I'm re returning to on, on that point, but I hope that helps clear up uh, the, 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 some of the differences within the um, within the study parameters that we um, we were we were working with. Thanks, Ralph. Well, we're getting near the end of our time, um, so I might just give you each um, the opportunity to add anything that uh, you feel you were uh, keen to say and that may not have um, come out or got across today. So I'll go to you first, Emma, and uh, and just. Uh, invite you really I guess to wrap up your your perspective and um, and, and mention anything else that you wanted to uh, table oh, I think Emma's I think she's frozen there on on my screen I don't know if that's uh, everyone's experience but um, yeah she looks like yeah, there might be a little interruption there. So Ralph Ralph I'll turn to you and just uh, <laughs> yep and just ask you what in a couple of uh, sentences what what you'd I guess like to say wrapping up look I think um although um although this study was um designed in haste I have to say um obviously we had no idea that the pandemic was coming so we couldn't do those first round of interviews what I would say is it served its purpose and um I would um, encourage um, all the stakeholders involved to think about how longitudinal qualitative studies like this can really help to enrich um, and uh, uh, our thinking about the interrelated um, uh, consequences um, uh, of of these uh, disasters. Really, what is which is what we're dealing with here, um, and take um, according policy action um, and I think that the um, I mean certainly it would be useful I'm sure to do um, return back to these households and wouldn't it be wonderful if we did this in five years time and found that as a result of the policy interventions post-COVID actually the lives of uh, these individuals had significantly improved um, so I do, I, I would sort of, um, having not really done this kind of research um, before, I would put a flag up and uh, uh, for it and say, I, I do think it's, um, uh, it's the fact that we had that initial data point really helped us uh, to kind of anchor the lived experience over a period of time to some extent. Um, 
but also I think I think this um, engagement with the policy uh, realm uh, and 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 making making sure that although we are obviously as academics trying to understand and theorise to some extent um, from this empirical work, um, we're also um, really delighted that this has been at the policy interface um, and um, uh, and 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 hopefully. Um, useful in 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 the near term well present and future as a result um so yeah I'll, I'll leave my comments there tom thanks great okay thanks very much ralph and thanks also emma nice to have you back with us sorry you apologies uh, just to print it really there. is live and online <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, really, thank you. Thank you both uh, for your contribution to our webinar today. I really appreciate it. It was a really great discussion. Um, and I'd also like to thank, of course, everyone who joined us today from, from around Australia and overseas and, and here in Victoria as well. Um, a quick reminder um, that you will be sent a survey and we'd appreciate your feedback. So um, please uh, do fill that in. That's really useful to us. Um, and also to remind you that um, if you want to be able to share um, any of the things that we discussed today with colleagues, um, there will be the recording available later on that you can, um, can uh, direct people to. And also, of course, the report, um, as I've said before, is there on the website right now and you're welcome to uh, download that for free and uh, distribute it as much as you like. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today, our final uh, HURI webinar for 2020. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Emma.